Zev, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Looking sharp. <laughs> Let's see if we can share this. Can you see my screen? Let me see what it looks like in presentation. There we go. Looks good. Okay. How long is it actually, Zeb? Uh, about 50 minutes. Five zero one five. Five zero. Five zero. Okay. What's the recommendation in terms of uh, starting? Do we start exactly at uh, ten after, or do we give it a couple minutes? Uh, I think. Well, I think we have a moderator. So, oh, Maurice on the chat. All I see for you now is uh, yeah, like I your... the, yeah, I move the slide. Yeah. Oh, okay. Remind me not to do that. <laughs> Why did you do that? Is that because you have two screens? No, because my keyboard was hidden behind my laptop. So. Oh, I see. Where are you out there? By the way, Shane, do I have background noise? Do I? No, I'm asking if I have background noise because there's somebody cutting their grass here. So I don't know. If that no, I can't hear. No, you, you're very clear. Oh, okay, clear. <clears throat> I'll keep an eye on any questions in the chat session, although you probably have it up as well, right? Yeah. Ori, can you hear us all right? <clears throat> Angela, I'm assuming you can hear us okay? Uh, he's the, I guess they're probably just watching versus uh, sharing. Thanks, Gil. I'll give it one more minute and then we'll kick it off and get started.
All right, Zev, what do you say? How about we get started here? So um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shane Kemp. I'm the general manager of Open Legacy's North American business. Thank you all for joining our workshop here. Uh, I also have with me today Zev Avidan, who is going to be providing the majority of the presentation. He is our chief product officer, and I'll let Zev introduce himself in a minute. But wanted to welcome everyone to our workshop today, where the focus will be becoming digital to the core. Uh, and so foundationally, that's really what the Open Legacy Design Platform delivers. Uh, and the workshop is focused on how to leverage legacy and on-prem assets in your digital transformation and digitally driven journey. Um, and with that, Zev, I'll turn it over to you and let you do uh, an introduction of yourself. What I would encourage everyone uh, to keep it as interactive and, and uh, any participation, please type in your questions, any questions you might have around the topics into the chat session, and we'll make sure that we address them either through the presentation or we'll have some time at the end to do some Q&A. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Zev. Thanks, Shane. Uh, so, yeah, so my name is uh, Zev Avidan. I'm Chief Product Officer for Open Legacy. And uh, I've been in the integration, specifically legacy integration space for uh, quite some time now, for 25 years now. Uh, and really what this uh, uh, um, um, session is about is how do I le men leverage my legacy assets in my digital uh, transformation? And specifically, we'll be introducing something called digital driven integration, which is kind of a new concept um, to how to seamlessly do that by, and, and so getting all the benefits uh, of a digital uh, transformation, uh, but not making any changes to your legacy side, which might be pretty uh, risky and costly. So before you know, delving into this, the digital side, uh, the legacy side, um, I'll talk a little bit about digital transformations. I mean, what are their drivers? What are we trying to uh, uh, solution for? And uh, what exactly you know uh, we see are you know uh, a lot of different organizations, mostly large uh, uh, enterprises do. So really the main drivers for digital transformations are around first and foremost, speed. I mean, speed is a killer app. Uh, everybody knows that. Uh, being able to move quickly, deploy uh, at velocity is paramount. Uh, just because you want to be, you know, react quickly to markets changing or, or be proactive. I think with the current, you know, coronavirus crisis, we're seeing that uh, entire industries changing their business models, model uh, models, basically kind of uh, um, turning on a dime. Uh, and so being able to be that flexible is a huge competitive advantage. And really, it's not just about being competitive in magic. That's what you know allows you to even stay in the competition. So speed, I think that's a pretty uh, uh, common thing uh, that everybody is familiar with. But there's also reach, which is basically this idea that through digital transformation, you're able to reach new markets, new customers, new types of customers uh, that you were not necessarily uh, reaching beforehand just because you're engaging with them with new digital channels, with through new partners, through uh, um, you know um, all kinds of startups and technology companies that now serve as your channel, the distribution channels for your digital uh, uh, product, something that was not uh, possible before. And the last but not least is what we call domains, which is basically, and, and this is sometimes overlooked, but it's extremely important. And that's the ability to interact between the different domains inside uh, the business, different lines of business, uh, maybe because the business has evolved through m as maybe just because traditionally, you know, mortgages, uh, loans, and, uh, you know, retail banking for, you know, accounts uh, and wealth management were all different lines of business. But really, that makes no sense keeping them separate. So the ability to um, basically make use of all the data that you have about a customer and bring that to bear for every interaction you have with that customer. That's what domain is all about. And that's a pretty big goal for digital transformation, just this ability to uh, um, get a 360 view of your customers and, and really consolidate all your lines of business into eventually the end goal of the, uh, of the company or the organization. 
So these are some drivers for digital transformation. And here are some, you know, approaches. And when we look in the market and, you know, we talk with a lot of different uh, uh, customers, a lot of enterprises, uh, tier one, tier two, tier three, you know, smaller, regional uh, and, and larger global, uh, you can basically say there are two major approaches to how you start on that journey. And I know that some of you might have already started on the journey and it might, you know, seem like uh, almost uh, redundant to talk about it, but, you know, and you there, there's also a lot of false starts and a lot of times where you start going on that journey and then you find out that you need to go back and maybe uh, uh, reevaluate some things. So really the two major approaches are the, the, the if you build it, they will come approach and the first and best approach. Uh, the if, it be, if you build it, they will come approach basically means that you're going on that journey of basically thinking, what are all the APIs that I'm going to need? Uh, maybe I need 200, maybe I need 1,000, maybe thousands of APIs. But basically, you're trying to solve for a baseline of APIs covering all of your major domains. Uh, you're trying to get it right from the get-go. You uh, optimize for a great API experience. Uh, you deploy it to the broadest platform possible. So you want it to be very scalable. So, uh, you know, if you can do it public cloud, then that's great. If not private cloud, if not not that, then maybe on-prem using cloud technologies. But you're trying to solve for the, you know, the most public platform possible. You target developers because you want to increase usage. You want to make it as easy as possible for all the developers to come and see what, you know, great APIs you're providing for them. Uh, you uh, invest in portal, in communications, in marketing. Uh, you try to sell that as, as your product. Um, you, you understand that everything will be used as part of kind of a mesh app together with other APIs. So it's really building a huge platform to build, not necessarily huge, but the, uh, the biggest platform you can do from the get go. So that's approach, you know, that, that approach is, is, has some pros and some cons. So first of all, it's scalable from the start. So that's great. If it you know, explodes, then great, you're already on your way. It's consumer-led. You're really trying to focus on on understanding your consumers uh, and, and really providing for them what they need. Uh, and it, internally for the organization, it's also it signals the importance of the initiative. If it's a big initiative, if it, there's a lot of resources driven to that, that signals to everybody this is an important initiative. You know, everybody should focus and should pay attention. Uh, there are, of course, some cons to that, and that's basically around the fact that you know you don't know what adoption is going to look like. And a lot of times when people are engaged with it this type of an initiative, adoption is a problem or adoption is at least something that they want to optimize for and are continuously evolving and changing and, and, and iterating in order to uh, increase the adoption. Uh, ROI, that's always a problem uh, with those types of approaches. You're, you're basically building a platform and you have no idea what the ROI is going to look like. You can make educated guesses, but do not expect to get it right. I mean, it's very, very hard to know uh, what the end result will, would be. Um, of course, you know, you might say, well, the ROI is me being, re you know, relevant, which, you know, I can't put a price on that. Uh, but uh, in terms of actual business justification, it's pretty hard to do. Doesn't mean you shouldn't go with that approach. It just, you know, it's inherently a challenge with this approach. Um, and also uh, relevance, you don't know if what you're doing, you're hoping it's relevant for your uh, audience and customers, but you don't really know. And, you know, iterating, it becomes an important. So there are cons and pros to this approach. Uh, but of course, there's the other approach, which, which is the first and best approach, uh, basically meaning you are your own first and best customer. So basically, this, in this approach, you identify an internal customer, somebody inside your organization, some domain, some line of business, and you design your APIs and your API strategy specifically for them. So what you're focusing on is providing them the best API experience you can ever get. And that includes, you know, the platform itself. It doesn't need to be a public cloud necessarily. It has to be optimized for them. So if for them, you know, uh, the best uh, uh, platform is an on-prem platform or is it private, you basically you optimize it for, for what they need to do. The same thing with the API experience. API experience for a broad audience might be different than the API experience for a specific line of business. In they need to know what the kind of you know language and terminology you use. So here you optimize it for that specific line of business. You iterate based on their very close and immediate feedback. Uh, you you know you have them on the phone. They tell you exactly what they need, what what you've done right, what they've done wrong. They might be you know or, or they should be part of the uh, design process. You only open it up to broader 
audience once it's mature. So there's a premise here, and the premise is that what you're doing for that line of business might be applicable as is or with some changes to a broader audience. That's usually the case, not always, but uh, you know that's why you need, want to carefully choose uh, which internal customer you you uh, sold for. Uh, but basically, once it's mature and once you, you you figure out, well, I get it. You know, I have a pretty good API experience here. I know what I'm doing. Then you open it up to a broader audience. And you use that initial success to promote. And that's also important. We talked about signaling importance within the organization. And again, change management and culture shifts they are as much a part of digital journeys as the technology is. So on the first case, we use you know, all the resources and attention to signal the importance. Here, we just use the success. If you have success with one initiative, you know, that draws attention. People notice success. People want to be part of success. So you do it once for a specific line of business. You're successful. You show results. Everybody's happy. And then you use that to promote inside the organization so that basically everybody can take a look and say, well, you know, I want, you know, one of those. So the pros of that approach is adoption is a no-brainer. You know exactly, you know, who's going to adopt it, adopt it. You can work in very agile, very close circles because you get immediate feedback and success brings attention, as we said. Uh, of course, the cons of that approach is scalability. You're not building it to scale. You're building it to solve a specific uh, 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 challenge. Whether or not it's easy to take what you've done and, and make it more scalable, that's a question. If you've done it right, I mean, it's easier. If you've made mistakes, then uh, that will be more difficult, but you're not optimizing for scalabilities from uh, the get-go. Also, there's a limited scope. You're only doing the one thing that you're doing, so you don't get a broader scope on the entirety of the business. Now, eventually, you will get a broader scope, but that's not how you start, and that's not what your thinking looks like from the get-go. So it's a bit of a, of a, of a, a shift that needs to happen later on. And of course, there's concentration risk. Concentration risk in terms of you're just doing that one project, it might fail for all kinds of reasons, because you didn't do your job, you know, creating the APIs good enough, or because of external reasons, or because of, you know, uh, internal politics or shift in attention or, or priorities. So there is concentration uh, risk with this approach. But so far, I mean, we talked about the drivers and the, uh, uh, and the approaches to digital transformation. Uh, and now, you know, what are your API opportunities? What should you look for? And won't go every bullet point by every bullet point, but basically there are a set of things that you need to look for when you are trying to solve for uh, what should my APIs be like. So of course, there's the internal developers, your, they're your partners, what kind of data and, and, and transactions and, and processes you want to make available to your partners, to the broader public, uh, you know, what What can I provide as a public API? Usually there's kind of, a, or at least at the beginning, people used to think about the public APIs uh, as, or the open APIs as the main thing. I think now people realize more and more that they're um, more of a tip of the iceberg and the internal APIs are more important than ever. But definitely the public APIs are, are something you want to consider. So in, in terms of my organization, you know, what kind of, informational processes can I provide to the broader public uh, to make them uh, use or you know create more value on top of me as a platform of course social you know social media uh, brings a lot of uh, uh, opportunities to create apis devices just to give you an example you know most banks don't do that some do uh, but if you for example you know it's a common experience I think well it used to be a common experience when you travel uh, when we all used to travel um, and you would go to you know a different country and you have a, you know you, you would do a credit card transaction and all of a sudden you get a notice that says well you know uh, we identified a transaction happening in you know London UK uh, and you're based in the, in in the US so that's a suspect we suspect that transaction is not legit uh, and, you know, that's a common experience. But if you just use your mobile device, you know, looking at your account five minutes ago from London and you identify yourself with biometrics or whatever, you know, face uh, recognition and, and you logged in from from London, why should you get that, you know, uh, a notice? So, again, that's an opportunity for an API. That's an opportunity to improve the uh, um, capabilities or improve uh, the user experience for your uh, customers. And, of course, data uh, that's you know that's always been the case. Uh, what kind of data you collect, what kind of data uh, you gain insights from. So all of these things are API opportunities. And you know, so far we've talked about digital transformation on uh, mass, but we're getting to the point where legacy becomes critical because everything we said up until now 
uh, really brings to point the idea of you will have a lot of APIs. And those APIs, you know, it's not just a set of, uh, you know, 100, 200, 1,000 APIs that you know you're going to need uh, and eventually, you know, uh, you're done. You're going to constantly uh, iterate on those APIs and create new ones. And so being able to move fast and create APIs quickly becomes important. And specifically when we talk about this concept, which is a key concept uh, that, you know, everybody should be familiar with, and that is an API as a product. You know, you used to think about API or we used to think about integrations. And now we think about API product. And what's the difference? Integration are supply side. So it's supply side thinking. I have, you know, a system, I have an application, and I want to push, you know, it used to be SOAP services. So these are the SOAP services that uh, uh, describe my system. It's asset oriented. Uh, it's project oriented. I have project to create those services. Um, it's tightly coupled integration in, in a lot of cases. Uh, it's finite in its scalability. Usually it's, it's built on monolithic middleware. The teams are horizontal. You have experts on different layers. So all of these are basically, you can think about the old SOA-based SOAP services as being this. Uh, and the way you measure those APIs is for quality. You measure them for you know how many milliseconds does it take to run those APIs versus API as a product which is demand side thinking. Basically, this is consumer oriented. Uh, your question is not what asset do I have and I want to expose, but rather what does my con you know, customer wants to consume? Uh, so these are consumer oriented and they are continuously managed products. They're not projects. They're not one off. It's not one and done. It's continuously managed. They have a life cycle and you sunset them eventually. You create them, you iterate on them. Uh, they're you know, supposed to be self-service and very consumable, very elastic. Um, usually they're implemented as microservices with cross-functional teams, but very importantly, you measure them for value, meaning you measure, you know, what am I getting out of this API? Is it making me any money? Is it supporting things that make me, you know, make money? Um, you know, should I even support it? Maybe I should sunset it. Maybe as a product, it's just not working for me. Nobody's using it. So, you know, as any product that nobody's using, maybe I should just get rid of it. So these are the kind of questions that you have when you talk about uh, API products. And that's all leads us to one of the biggest challenges. Because now we start talking about you know, large enterprises. And you, know, you have this new way of thinking about API as product and you know, uh, all, all those APIs opportunities that you find and those different strategy, each one of them in its own way uh, lends itself to building a lot of different APIs. But then again, you know, if you're a large enterprise, I mean, legacy systems, you know, they hold most of the world's data. And if you are a Fortune 500 company, most likely you have legacy. And we're talking some deep legacies, we're talking mainframes and S400s uh, and, and all kinds of very deep legacy uh, systems. And of course, the problem with that is that they're not very digital friendly. Uh, you know, they don't play well with others. Uh, it's, it's hard to integrate them to a digital strategy, not just in, in terms of, the connection. Remember, we're not talking about integrations as a technical thing. We're talking about API as a product. And API as a product has some expectations around how fast and, and you know what's the price or what's the cost, sorry, for, for building it. So integrating those things into a, the, this new way of thinking uh, really kind of is challenging uh, because, you know, we, we talk with a lot of our enterprises, and usually what they will say is that if they have a legacy system, creating a digital service or an API out of their legacy system, that's a four to six to nine months uh, uh, time effort. And, you know, if you think about it, six months, I mean, that's an average. That's a, that's a lot of time. Uh, you know, compare that to a startup. A startup, you know, starts and ideate and, you know, and, and, and launch a product and gets to the first millions of customers in six months. Six months is a long time. And when you have somebody saying, well, you know, six months, that, that's my expectation for developing a single digital service. And we just saw that you will need hundreds of them, if not thousands, and you will need to iterate on them constantly and improve them. You know, just imagine what that means to a business that wants to keep, you know, competitive and wants to be very, uh, uh, you know, uh, proactive in the market. Uh, and now they're, they're hitting that kind of wall of their IT being very, very slow. And it's not just about the speed. The speed definitely is the most important thing. That's the killer app. But it's also the cost, right? I mean, APIs now has a value attached to them. You know, if, it's, if it costs you 100K to create an API, 
you know, there's a certain, and, and you need a lot of them, there's a certain amount of business that you need to happen uh, in order to make it worth your while. So really, it's a big challenge for a lot of our organization. And sometimes it's kind of a, almost a hidden challenge, meaning they know that the legacy is a problem. They know that legacy holds them back, but they don't even know exactly how, by how much. They can't put a number on that. Uh, and when we go through the exercise of, um, we have a BVA process, a business value assessment process. When we go through the exercise of finding out and floating that value and, 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 and maybe, you know, rather the cost, uh, usually people are surprised to understand just how costly it is uh, to have a legacy system, not just in terms of getting, keeping the lights on. They know how much it costs to keep the lights on, but in terms of the opportunity cost and in terms of the things that they cannot do uh, because they have, or, or they even in advance uh, uh, assume they cannot do just because they have a legacy system. So, you know, what is there to do about that? Well, you know, obviously we can't keep uh, 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 doing things the same way. So is there a solution? And of course there is, otherwise we wouldn't be talking. Uh, so the solution is, it comes in terms of what we call digital driven uh, integration. So what is digital driven integration? Digital driven integration is basically reversing the thought process uh, in terms of, um, in, in terms of the, the, the whole equation here. I mean, why is it important? We've talked about all of those things. You know, it's important for the business. And we mentioned why it's important for the business time to market, but also consider the IT part. I mean, when you consider the way we do integration today or used to do integration, you know, there's a lot of complexity, a lot of teams, a lot of people, a lot of technologies that are involved. When we're talking digital driven integration, we're kind of shifting our thinking. So basically what we're thinking about is not how do I integrate into my legacy system, but rather how do I make my legacy assets consumable as digital assets. That's an important distinction because once you start to think like that, then you realize that a lot of the things that we're doing today are not exactly the way we want to do them. So for, first of all, let's set up some you know, uh, uh, ground rules in terms of what are we solving for? That's always important. We want to reduce, first of all, speed. We want to increase the speed. We want to reduce the cost, you know, the total cost of ownership. And also, very importantly, we want to commoditize the skill set. One of the things that's always kind of a problem with legacy systems is that it's a, it's a dwindling, diminishing skill set. Uh, they don't make a, you know more people uh, with uh, you know 50 years of experience on the mainframe. Uh, there's just not you know they're not making any more of those. Um, so we need to solve also for the the skill set. So what does the solution look like? I mean, this is a traditional architecture that most organizations have some sort of you know variation on that. Uh, it is uh, an ESB, service-oriented type ESB middleware, uh, and you have your you know, legacy asset. And basically, in order to you know, expose or create an API, you need to go through this entire stack. That means you have a lot of people that are involved in different places, right? So people who are setting up you know, uh, MQQs and the ESB workflows and doing all kinds of mapping, they need to understand in details the minutia of how do you map COBOL to you know, modern di data types uh, and all of those things. There's a lot that goes in there. And it's not just about the products and people uh, themselves. It's also about a lot of business logic that creeps into that middleware uh, platform. So those middlewares became, become bloated. And basically now you have a legacy monolith. And on top of it, you, you have another monolith, which is your integration monolith, which might be more complex. Uh, uh, and, and, and even, you know, just because of the fact that it was never designed to hold that uh, or hold all of that business logic, it really becomes unmanageable and unmaintainable. And so on top of that, you stack your, you know, modern uh, uh, digital, you know, microservice uh, mesh or whatever it is that you're using. So that makes it very brittle. And at the end of the day, you can't really move faster than the slowest link in the chain. And the chain cannot be stronger than the most brittle link in that chain. And you're introducing a lot of uh, complexity uh, and a very brittle link in, in your uh, digital uh, chain. And so the process of moving from A to B is convoluted, is complex, is not where you wanna, where you wanna be. And it goes completely against all of the principles of DevOps, microservices, and so on and so forth. So what would be a different approach? So digital driven integration comes at a problem from a completely uh, different way. Basically what it says is let's do away with all of the you know, legacy of 
for lack of a better word, a legacy of service-oriented architectures. And basically, we think the problem in terms of what does my digital architecture look like? Well, first of all, it's not uh, uh, centralized. It's distributed. We're talking containerization. We're talking microservices. Also, it's not proprietary. It's always you know, very standard. Uh, we use open source frameworks. We use uh, you know, all kinds of things. And also, we leverage heavily code generation. If you think about it, you know, um, starting from um, Ruby on Rails really was kind of a breakthrough. Uh, Ruby on Rails, the programming language, but then JavaScript really kind of exploded with that. Uh, and now it's ubiquitous. Code generation has become a really powerful thing. Basically, for almost any type of development you're doing, basically, you just you, you get a lot of boilerplates, and you just deal with the functionality that you want to change. That's how you do app development today. That's not how you do integration today. So that's you know something that needs to change. And digital-driven integration change exactly that. So basically, the idea is that you automatically generate components for each legacy uh, not legacy layer and not legacy application, but for each legacy functionality. So that's important. Microservices are around, you know, uh, cu coupling and, and making very granular specific functionalities. Now, of course, you want to be careful not to be too granular, but basically if it's a business functionality like, you know, get customer details, that should be a service. Uh, and so exactly the same way you componentize uh, those specific services from the legacy system into those automatically generated components. And they are the entire integration stack for that specific piece of functionality. And that's very important because once you do that, basically you have a digital representation of that functionality without changing anything, without moving away from your legacy system. You just have this one piece of you know digital asset that's a representation behind the scenes of the legacy side. And now it can be just used as a data store inside the microservice. You can use it wherever you, way you want. You're not dealing with integrations anymore. Your digital developers, they don't care about where it comes from. They have a digital asset. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a Java component or a you know, .NET component or, or a JavaScript component, and they just leverage that the, the way they would do any type of component. Your legacy people, they don't care about you know, the fact that it's being used as an API. They basically just create what they've always created. They create COBOL programs, and you know, they don't care about that. That automation and code generation is really the key. That's the secret sauce here. And basically, you do that, not only do you get a, a very, very fast and agile way of creating those services, but also those services are completely standard. So in a way, now that you moved it into you know, code generation and everything is basically just a code project, you, you're not really doing integration anymore, which was the, the goal. I mean, now you consolidated the way you develop applications and the way you do integration into the, you know, the same stream, the same pipeline. So in terms of your DevOps pipeline and continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, um, uh, processes. I mean, basically, you consolidated everything, and you're not doing two separate separate things. You're not doing app development and integration, and you know, one you know, there's the team to do that, and there's another team to do that. You have it, it boils down to a single person who can do that service. You know, all the way from uh, your legacy mainframe or S400 or SAP on-prem or Oracle application, whatever the legacy on-prem system is, one person can do that and not an entire team of people. And of course, that gives you an opportunity also, you know, automate a lot of the cross-cutting concerns, security, analytics, telemetry, so that they're very consistent. Um, so, I mean, in essence, that's what digital-driven uh, is about. It's automatic code generation, it's direct to legacy connection, and it's flexible deployment, you know, it's standard uh, code pro uh, project, and the impact is pretty dramatic. Uh, I mean, if you consider the fact that, uh, you know, we, we, if you ask anybody hands on keyboards how long have you been working, they will, you know, tell you two hours here, two days there. Uh, if you look at the entire process, the entire chain of things that needs to happen, you know, that's where you get to the six months. And it's design, build, test, develop, all of those things. If you do things in a certain way uh, upstream, they will uh, basically, uh, uh, um, you know, affect everything downstream. And that will lead to those uh, long, you know, time frames and, and, and costs. And so when you move to digital driven integration, you basically optimize the entire process. You streamline the entire process. And that has a huge impact. And that's just an example, uh, you know, from, uh, 
uh, example from a customer for an actual use case, you know, 13 times faster API creation, 92% lower cost per API, 30% better API uh, speed in terms of performance because you delay and you remove complexity, and 3.1 million savings on year one. So these are not the, the point here. These are not. Um, um, you know, evolutionary steps. These are not uh, uh, small improvements. This is a huge impact on the business. And really, one of the things that you need to consider when moving to this type of digital driven integration is how would that impact change the way you think about things? Because now you're not spending 12 months on creating that one digital product that you wanted to uh, deploy. Now you're spending a month. So if you can do in a month what you used to you know, take 12 to 18 months to do, maybe that's a change in business strategy. Maybe one, now you can do things you know, in a different way. Maybe, for example, as one of our customers is doing, you can deploy multiple uh, uh, different products and multiple different uh, you know, uh, offerings out there in the market, see what sticks and invest in that. You're not spending so much time and money on creating every single digital uh, product. So you know, might as well do a lot of those. Might, or for example, move to a, an approach where you really position yourself as the digital platform. Uh, you know, you have a digital platform and you invite everybody uh, uh, to integrate with you. And when, you know, you want to onboard a partner, it's not a six months effort of, you know, you trying to figure out what resources you might want to uh, uh, commit to uh, uh, onboarding that partner. It's basically as automatic as, you know, tell me what you need. Tell me how your API should look like, and I'll create it to you, you know, within, I don't know, a week or so. That's a dramatic shift in the capabilities. And, and that also allows you to move from being reactive to the market, which is already not an easy thing to do, just, you know, keeping up with the market, but also be proactive, see, you know, ahead of the curve and, and try to, you know, put things out there. And again, because you know that the cost for doing so is not that big, you know, you're allowed to fail. You're not investing so much when you do that. So you're allowed to fail and you can be very kind of proactive and, you know, take the hits, you know, well, did that, that didn't work. Maybe something else would work. I didn't spend all that, you know, time and money on it anyway. Um, so that's why it's a deep impact on, on the business. And again, we're talking specifically about legacy systems, but, you know, and for a lot of organizations, that's where the core of the business lives. I mean, that's where the core data, where's, that's where the core system. And, and today, a lot of organizations, they look at their legacy systems and they think of them as kind of a hindrance. They think of them as an anchor uh, that holds them back. This approach allows them to use the legacy as an engine. That becomes your competitive advantage. You already have everything set in place. You have tons of data, tons of processes. You know, all the, you know, for heavily regulated industries, that's where, your, you know, all of your comp compliance knowledge uh, lies. That's where, you know, years and years and years of optimization where they lie. That should not be an anchor. That should be an engine. That should be a, 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 a you know, competitive advantage versus, you know, newcomers who, you know, still have a lot to learn. If you only can uh, unleash that uh, data, that, that, that knowledge, um, and, and use it, uh, in, in ways that are, you know, accommodating to digital processes, that's a pretty important thing. Uh, um, I'll kind of uh, finalize that with a, another example. And this is from a pretty large bank. Uh, and, you know, the mess that you see here, I think, you know, maybe some of you can, you know, relate to that uh, because that's what we see with a lot of organization. And that's not even a very complex one. I mean, that's a diagram, a simplified even diagram of what they're, we're looking at in terms of their IT infrastructure. And they had, you know, multiple, you know, uh, legacy systems. That's true. They had, you know, uh, as you can see, Unisys and Tandem and Teradata uh, and all kinds of different uh, backend core applications. But importantly, and you'll find it in many organizations, these are seven different layers of middleware, seven different layers of middleware products, you know, all doing supposedly kind of the same thing, but being introduced in different you know, times, in different eras, different technologies for different purposes, that adds a lot of you know, complexity to what they were trying to do. And really what they were trying to do is to move to a digital first kind of approach, simplify their architecture. And really, again, it all comes back to speed, being able to deliver for their customers. Uh, because that specific bank, they, they found themselves in a place where they were a bit trailing in terms of their digital experience. So they did not want to miss the bus in terms of, uh, we used to call them millennials. Now millennials are older, but uh, let's say the, uh, 
the, the Zoomers, I think that's the new uh, concept, but really the younger uh, um, uh, and more technology advanced uh, type uh, audience, they really didn't want to miss out on them because you know today when you choose a bank, and and the model for banks are you know you open an account and then you know everything else is an upsell, uh, just the initial account. A lot of people now choose their accounts based on you know what's how does the bank app look like. I mean, if it's not convenient for me to deposit checks or check my account or you know do all kinds of things, I'm not going to go with that bank. So and I have a lot of options. So giving a great digital experience at that point is a crucial thing. And that's where they, were, where they wanted to move towards. And so that complexity did not help them. Uh, and true, they have a lot of you know, legacy, but that's no reason why not to be digital. And it, you know, when they uh, actually employed digital driven integration, that's where they moved to. And again, they still have those legacy systems. They didn't move away or migrate any of those legacy systems. You know, there is uh, a way to migrate from legacy system using this approach, which is more granular and gradual. Uh, that's definitely one of the benefits because it kind of decouples all the business functionalities. But even at the base, uh, uh, you know, the baseline of this type of approach, you're not migrating anything. You, you still have your legacy systems, uh, but you're leveraging them in a completely different way. And this is how they're able to basically make those legacy system just part you know a first class citizen in their architecture together with the cloud system that they have uh, employed uh, so basically you know that's the their new architecture and it's much more simple and and uh, uh, um, streamlined and more importantly they move to this concept called an API factory and an API factory is basically I mean they really went all the way uh, it's it's a different floor in the building and it looks like a you know like a like a startup with uh, all, all the trappings of, of a startup but basically you know uh, they're able to deploy dozen of digital services in in, in one spring uh, they're they're able to basically be and that's kind of the Nirvana state of digital driven integration the Nirvana state is you want to be uh, constrained by demand not by your ability to execute. So basically the question is not how many APIs would I need this time next year, is if I get a new request for you know, tens, hundreds of APIs next year, how long will it take me to create them? That's really where you wanna be because you wanna be, you know, again, think about APIs as products and think about all of those things that we mentioned to begin with. You wanna have that flexibility, it's that important. And having a legacy system should not be a reason for you not to have that flexibility. Uh, it, it should be a reason for you to uh, in, in, uh, embrace digital driven integration, leverage those legacy systems, make the most out of them, and really you know, make them into a competitive advantage versus any emerging company out there in the field that tries to do things faster, better, you know, uh, in a more expedited way, uh, you will be able to uh, compete against them and really, you know, show that large organizations can move as fast as small organizations. Um, so, um, I have uh, some time for, for uh, questions. So I don't know if there are any, any questions. Uh, uh, Zeb, well, uh, I'll wait to see if any uh, additional questions come into the, the chat, but I, I, there's a couple of questions here that I think from a strategy perspective, right? You introduced the concept of um, the supply side uh, integration um, versus the demand side and API as a product. As we know, and as you see from your global perspective, um, many organizations are in the midst of um, you know, strategies are around legacy, full scale migrations, um, partial migrations, uh, you know, moving to the cloud. H how do you marry up the concept of API as a product uh, and the demand side with the, the current strategies that are already in place and may have been under, in, underway for, for years around migration of legacy assets? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of unbundle here. So I'll, I'll kind of uh, take it one step by step. So yeah, almost every organization today is already on some part of the journey to digital. I mean, I don't think that there's any organization that has been completely asleep in the last you know five to seven years saying you know that's not relevant for us. So everybody's on on that journey. Uh, but you might be on different places in that journey. I mean, you might be completely digitized, you know, completely you know at your nirvana state. That's unlikely. Um, and I think the more you advance into uh, your transformation, the more you realize that there's more to be done. Um, but 
Uh, and certainly some organizations are very early on. I think that uh, this approach is relevant for all steps. And the reason for that is if you are you know, just starting out, that approach really kind of uh, helps you with doing two things. First of all, resetting the way you think about how to access your legacy and current uh, application, you know, just what, you know, how do you architect for them, but also resetting your expectations. That's a huge thing. Uh, again, a lot of organizations, they just see their legacy systems as inherently slow. That should not be the case. Uh, if you ask a mainframe developer, and I, I should know because I've been one uh, uh, for, for quite some time in, in the past, uh, you know, it doesn't take weeks or months to, to make changes on, on, a, on the mainframe application. It takes, you know, hours maybe. Uh, DevOps, a great new concept, has basically existed in one shape or form on the mainframe for, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, automated uh, deployments and all of those things. Do you think, you know, the mainframe is able to move very fast? The same for an S400, the same for SAP, you know, R3, the same for, I mean, that's not where the problem is. So resetting your expectation means how fast can I leverage what I'm doing there on the legacy side? And that's kind of resetting the, the expectations on my architecture and, and really kind of on, on the way that I uh, um, incorporate everything into one streamlined uh, uh, process. So when you're starting out, that's resetting both the architectural view and also the, um, uh, the expectation. But even if you are, let's say you are on the other side of the spectrum and you are migrating away from your legacy system, and that's great. You know, migration at the end of the day, maybe that's the ultimate solution. That's not great. That's going to take, uh, that's going to take some time. So in the meantime, you have to account for shifting priority, all kinds of um, you know, uh, I think that my region, if eventually your migration, you know, takes place over the span of two years or three years, which is fast, or even seven years, you need to have some mitigation strategies. Uh, so even if you're doing everything right, you still have to do to have mitigation strategies. And here, that type of approach can be a mitigation strategy in terms of what happens if my migration doesn't work, you know, as well as it should, or if just priorities shift and there's something more important. So at every step of the way, this type of thinking adds more value, but it's it's valuable in every step of the way. Zev, you're you're a little bit muffled when you, I, I don't know if your your hands covering your microphone, but um, just just so you're aware of that. Um, so two questions, I think I'll wrap into one. One is, um, you know, the ability to access. Do we have the ability to access um, homegrown applications? And then sort of associated with that is, do we support out of the box any banking packages like? Avalok or Olympic, um, and maybe you know I'll even throw in there the the open banking uh, API. So maybe if you can comment on those items. Sure. Uh, so first of all, in terms of uh, of the home, I mean uh, I'm I'm shifting here a bit because digital driven integration is a concept uh, specifically about what Open Legacy does. Um, yeah, absolutely. We support a lot of different core. I mean, uh, financial services are our core. You know. Uh, uh, um, uh, customers. Uh, we support multiple different uh, um, core banking applications, uh, including the ones mentioned, uh, but in addition, Hogan and Alnova uh, and FIS and uh, Fiserv. Uh, the principle, the same principles apply. Uh, the only change is the, you know, the details of how you create those components that I mentioned. Uh, uh, but yeah, they're supported out of the box, but also Again, with this approach, because it's a co-generation approach, there's a huge amount of uh, um, uh, templating that can be done uh, and adhering or, or fitting it to specific considerations that need to, to have. So even if it's a completely homegrown application, usually it will take between one to three weeks to create a what we call a connector or a generator for it. Um, and from there on, it's just, you know, it's smooth sailing because you're, you're just doing the same thing over repeatedly in an automated way. So it is uniquely designed to deal with uh, uh, those type of, uh, of concerns. And then another question was about um, support for on-prem versus the cloud. So maybe just comment on that, please. Sure. So again, the, the component that you're creating 
and then the microservices that, that they are uh, um, wrapping those components or using those components, they use what we call cloud technologies. But cloud technologies is a term that sometimes is being kind of misunderstood. When you talk about cloud technology, it doesn't mean that it has to run on the cloud. I mean, after all, the cloud is just somebody else's computer, right? So the same components, the same thing can run on-prem, on a private cloud, on a public cloud, on a function cloud, you know, whatever you want to, to, to run them, they just use cloud technologies. And the reason why that's important is because cloud technology gives you all the scalability and, you know, the ease of governing it and all of those things that are, you know, great and, and problems that we used to solve at the product level, now they're solved at the infrastructure level. So you're getting all the benefits, but that does not mean you have to run on the cloud. So, of course, as Open Legacy, we support, you know, on-prem, private, public, function clouds, all of the above. And then, I, um, so I know from, um, you know, from a partnership perspective, and maybe this is a good example of uh, the integration versus as a product, um, we've announced quite a few partnerships recently, um, you know, Talend, Dell Boomi, Calibra, Big ID, as well as many others, May maybe paint a picture for how and what problem we're solving specifically and how that aligns into uh, API as a product versus uh, solving the integration challenge. Sure. So as a general, I mean, it's, it's often said that uh, legacy integration uh, is, a, is a horizontal problem with vertical solutions. And that's very true. I mean, a lot of organizations have legacy problems. And so it's a horizontal problem, but the minutia of dealing with their specific brand or, or strand of, of, of legacy system, that's what makes it very uh, uh, verticalized. And also the use cases are verticalized. I mean, integration is never, you never do integration for integration's sake. You, you, know, you want to do it for a reason. And so by providing a platform that allows you to uh, basically you know, employ a horizontal solution to a horizontal problem, meaning you have one platform to deal with all of your different legacy assets, meaning all of your different legacy applications, all of the domains within the application, all of the different types of interfaces your application might uh, expose. That means that you can now do things like, for example, with our uh, partner network, you know, have a, a single repository of components that everybody can leverage. So, for example, if you're, uh, you know, an enterprise and you build that repository of, of artifacts, uh, we call them SDKs, but, you know, uh, that's our name for it. Uh, and you have this repository of SDKs. Now, for example, you know, you want to do uh, California regulation, the right to be forgotten, and, you know, Big ID are great at doing that. Uh, and they're a partner of ours, you just use the SDKs for them. Uh, or you want to use, uh, you know, a, a Calibra, another partner of ours, to do uh, data governance, uh, you know, that's the, you, those artifacts provide you with the metadata that you need. Uh, you want to do it, you know, with Dell Boomi, which is a great uh, product for creating APIs, you know, the, the high level orchestrating them uh, and create API experiences. You know, you, you want them to leverage the legacy asset. You use the same legacy assets. It's the same components. So it's, it, it really brings you a horizontal solution to that horizontal problem. Uh, and, and really kind of, it, it really supports building an ecosystem on top of your uh, legacy application. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Zev. I think that is brings us to the end of the session. Um, thank you, Zev, for, for providing that overview and perspective. Thanks for everyone for participating. If there are any additional questions, you can certainly reach out to uh, either of us. Um, feel free to uh, visit our website, www.openlegacy.com, and we'll look forward to having deeper discussions with everyone as we go forward. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.